to say that, look, you are not going to be very different from what you think. You are not going to behave differently from what is in your mind. In other words, your, your life will almost always take the character of your thinking. If you think in a certain direction, you are most likely going to act that way. You are most likely going to behave that way. Why? Because that is your mentality. Your mentality precedes your behavior. Your mentality precedes your personality. Your mentality precedes the way that you deal with anything that is around you, including your subordinates, including car clients, anything in as far as our life is concerned. So how do you think? What are the things that you spend your time thinking about? What is your mentality? Now look, the word mind here is not talking about your physical brain. It's talking about your mentality. You know, you can refer to someone's mind as uh, uh, in two things, in two ways actually. I can say your mind refers to either your brain, like matter in your head, or it, it, can, it can refer to your mentality. Like when you say, my mind on this matter is, it doesn't necessarily mean your physical brain. It means the way you think about this matter. Am I making sense? That's what he's talking about there. Your mentality. So he says here, my mind, I mean the mind, it is the master power. In other words, it is the most powerful thing that you have. It is ability to make and ability to mold. Now, what is to make? What does the English word mean? What is to make something? Creating. Now, what is to create? To create means to bring into existence something which was not there before. That's creation. I mean, if you reproduce something that already existed, you're not really creating it, are you? You're simply reproducing something which was created. And your mind is creative power. You can create new things. You can create new patterns of behavior. It's all in your mind. And he says here, not only can it create, it can also mold. What is to mold? Shape. To shape. Molding means shaping. How many of you know how uh, the African pot is made? Clay. Okay, so you take clay, you mix it with water, then you start to mold it or to shape it. All right? So your mind, not only can it create entirely new things, and this applies to everybody, by the way, it can also shape certain things. Remember, I'm speaking hypothetically here. I want you to, 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 to realize that the way that you deal with people, the way that you behave, is completely changeable. This is, this is where I want to get to. Now, he says here, and man is mine. Just stop there. And man is mine. What does that mean? And man is mine. You are just a reproduction of what is in your brain. You're not very different from that. In other words, if I want to understand what kind of person you are, sir, I just watch the way you behave. Because the way you behave will tell me what's in your mind. You can pretend, but for a short while. After some time, you get tired of pretending, then the real person will come. <laughs> you know what I'm talking about? So, you are exactly a reproduction of what is in your mind. He says here, and he takes a tool of thought. To shape what he wills. In other words, in simple English, this means man, mankind, uses his thoughts. We use our thoughts to do what? To shape what we want. Bring forth a thousand joys or a thousand ills. Now, you know with your mind, you can bring joy. You know what's called joy? Joy to your life, with your mind. You can also bring what, 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 what James Allen calls here a thousand ills, which is like the opposite of joy. Which is like sadness and anxiety and worry. Yeah. Have you ever seen some people who seem to be joyful all the time? Like they don't have problems. Have you ever seen them? Yeah. Like they're always happy every day. Yeah. Like they seem happy to every day. Yeah. And he says here, just to continue with this, I want everybody to read this sentence for me if you don't mind. From here to that full stop there. Everybody, one, two, go. He thinks he's serious and it comes to pass. Okay. I'm going to ask you to read it again. Try to make sense of it as you read. Again, one, two, go. He thinks in secret and comes to us. Beautiful. So every person thinks in secret, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. But look, uh, whatever you think in secret for some time, it has a tendency to manifest in the physical. Now, this is not spiritual, it's pure biology. Okay? Whatever. I, I, I was talking to the group yesterday and I said, you see, it's Thoughts that are given time, they manifest in the physical. Uh, how, do, how, do, how do I put this? And 
Your brain is like this. Just look at this. This is your brain. Okay? It's divided into two parts. How many of you here studied biology a bit before? A little bit. Okay? A little bit. <laughs> All right. Now, you probably know in biology that your brain is like, uh, if I was to put it in simple terms, it's like the computer of your body. Your brain is responsible for everything that you do. There is nothing that you do that is not controlled by your brain. I mean, for you to look at me the way you are, do you know what happened? It's your brain that told your eyes to do that. For you to put your, your hand under your chin, do you know what happened? It's your brain that told your hand to do that. If it hadn't uh, told your hand to do that, you wouldn't, be, you wouldn't have done that. Everything is controlled by your brain. Even your blinking, even the growth of your hair is controlled by your brain. Gentlemen, I'm sure you know, if your brain tells your hair that, my friend, from here, we are no longer growing, you know your hair stops growing. <laughs> <laughs> okay? It's everything that you do is controlled by your brain. But the nice thing about the brain is it's completely manipulatable, if there's such a word. You can manipulate it. You can control your thoughts. Now, there are two sides to your brain. So there's this part and there's that part. Two sides. And they, they, they are... They work, they work, uh, they sort of uh, are related to each other in some way. Now, the first part of your brain is called the conscious mind. Everybody say conscious mind. Conscious mind. What is a conscious mind? What do you think? What do you think is a conscious mind? What is it responsible for? Mm -hmm. Who wants to try? Yes. Are you are aware of your thoughts. You are okay. aware of your actions. All right, thank you. Thank you. You're not very far. Your conscious mind is that part of your brain which is responsible for the things that you do consciously. Maybe you wonder, what does it do with conflict management? It's got everything to do with it. You know, you know if I can help you to, 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 to sort of manipulate the way you think, you are never going to be able to deal with conflict in the workplace. And conflict is such a big thing in the workplace. I know some, some supervisors or managers here, they struggle a lot to deal with some subordinates. Why? Precisely because of this. So I want to get a point where I can make you understand what is your role in as far as this is concerned. Now look, your conscious mind is that part of your brain which is responsible for everything that you do consciously. Like what, when you are aware of it. Uh, for example, do you remember the days you were learning to drive a car? Remember those days? Okay, you were using your conscious mind. How? Because this is what happened to most of us. Someone sat on the passenger seat. Then you sit on the driver's seat, you are learning to drive, and then they tell you, okay, now press the clutch. Sometimes you press the accelerator by mistake. You are, you are making lots of errors there. And, and before you change the gear, you have to look at the gear lever, didn't you? Why? You were so conscious of the driving. You were so aware of what you were doing. So gear number one, you look at it. You, you, you know, then number two, because you didn't know where one or two or three was. You are aware, you are conscious of your driving. Huh? Tell me, if your cell phone rang, would you answer it? Or oh, maybe there were no cell phones that time. <laughs> but would you answer your cell phone? No, no. Why wouldn't you answer your cell phone? Because you're concentrated. Because you're concentrated. You are conscious of your driving. So you don't want to be distracted by anything else. The more you repeated the driving experience, on Monday, then Tuesday, week one, week two, week three, week four, huh? you are repeating the same thing, the same routine. What happened is the skill of driving shifted from the conscious mind into the second part of your brain, which is called, who can guess? Unconscious. All right, subconscious mind. <laughs> no, yes, you don't want to be unconscious, do you? <laughs> okay, it's called the subconscious mind. Say subconscious mind, everybody. Subconscious. Very good. So it's called the subconscious mind. Okay, now check. I want this to make sense to you. Now, what is the subconscious mind? Now, by contrast, by contrast, your subconscious mind is that part of your brain which is responsible for everything that you do subconsciously. Maybe let's go back to the driving example. Okay. Now, these days, you no longer drive your car consciously. You drive your car subconsciously. Not unconsciously, <laughs> subconsciously. <laughs> In other words, you get in the car, you just know where gear number one is. Somehow, you know where two is. 
You know three is here, you know four is here, you know five is here, you know six is here. You, you just know that. You just get in the car. I'm sure you guys, you drove to this place today. Is there anyone in this place who says, I remember at that traffic light, corner Malibongo and so and so on, putting into gear number one. Do you remember that? You no longer remember, isn't it? Why? Because you're driving subconsciously. You just get in the car, gear number one, two, from two sometimes to four. You just feel the car. Now you can drive, talk on your phone, eat at the same time, and get some fine tickets too, isn't it? Because I wrote a book, you know. And maybe this is something slightly different from conflict, but it will help, you to, it help me to illustrate this point. The book is called The Power of Positive Imagination. And you know, something that I always wondered growing up was, what is it that makes some people to be so successful? You know, you know successful people, like seriously successful people. What is it that makes them to be so successful? How do they get there? What is it that makes them to be there and to stay there? And what is it that made these people who are exactly the opposite to be like that? And I used to think, growing up, that these ones are up there because they were born in rich families, because their parents could afford them to take them to expensive schools and so on and so on. You know, they were just born with a silver spoon in their mouth. And these ones were exactly the opposite. Until I did my research, I met about 24 in my research. I met 24 people that I consider to be very successful. Some of them you know them. And you know, I was surprised. This is primary research that I did. 13 of those people, this is more than half of the people that I interviewed. Some of them gave me a week, some of them gave me an hour, some two hours. I just wanted to understand their story and I put everything in the book. I discovered that 13 of the people that I interviewed that I considered to be up there, 13 of them, at one time, they were street kids. I'm talking about street kids. How did they get there? And then I found out that some people who were down there, at one point, they had an opportunity to go to school. I don't want to say they were born in rich families, but they had an opportunity to really make something out of their lives. Some of them could afford to, to be taken to nice schools. What happened? Until I made a conclusion that you see, success, or the opposite of it, is, a, is, is really a mind thing. You know, there is a, uh, 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 a saying in economics that you know in this world 90% of this world's resources they are owned by only 10% of the population now whether this is subjective or not well, that's another issue but the, the, the general idea is most of the resources in this world are owned by few people so we can use a, a, a very objective figure here we say 90% of the world's resources owned by just 10% of the population and then the 90% of the population, they scramble for the remaining 10%. So this gentleman was saying that, do you know, if we go and take 90% of the resources from the 10% population, and we go and give those to the 90% population, just wait after a few years. Mm -hmm. All the resources, they start saying, we want to go back home. To where? To the 10%. Do you get the maths here? <laughs> It's like resources give some people and say, hey, I, I can't stay here. I, I, have to go, I have to go where I belong. Why? It's a mind thing. Haven't you heard stories of someone winning the lottery today? Ten years down the line, they are back in the streets begging. Yeah. What happened? Because it's, it, the problem has never been about the resource or the money. It's always been about the mind. You know, I, I, I also, you know, fascinated on financial management. This is the most important thing. Now, in the book, I, I, I designed something which I called the wheel of life. Okay? Come on. Thoughts. thoughts. What are thoughts? What language do you speak? Pedi. What is thoughts in Pedi? Kupul. What do you speak, sir? What are thoughts in Africa? Kadaftas. Sounds like a disease. <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. It's like you saying, uh, I'm suffering from heart attacks. I'm joking, I'm joking. All right. Now, thoughts, what are thoughts? If someone were to ask you to define the term thoughts, imagine someone asked you, what is the, what is the, what are thoughts? What would you say? Define the term thoughts, five marks. What would you say? What you, what do you hear, think? What you hear inside yourself. What, what you? What you hear inside yourself, in your silence. What do you hear inside yourself? Yeah. 
Or oh, the conversation you have. Whatever you think about, <laughs> your thoughts are what? Something that you see that you hear, then you create it in your mind. Right, this thing's in your mind, okay? All right, beautiful. Thoughts, maybe, for, for lack of a better description, all right? And, and I want to, because that's not the most important thing. I, I just want us to, to do it correctly. Let's just say, let's just say, for argument's sake, all right? Thoughts refer to these images in my mind. Okay? You, you, you get this, some of them they just come and they go because you don't really care about them, but there's this one that comes but you're like, hey, then you can expand on it. This, these are thoughts, okay? Maybe we don't have a, a very good definition, but I think you understand what I'm talking about. But tell me guys, where do thoughts come from? Right. Do they have an origin? Or they're just... So, thoughts come from the things that you see with your eyes. You know, it's important what you see. Exactly. So, you see something, and then what you see, the image of that thing gets into your eyes and then into your brain. In other words, your eyes act as windows into your brain. I'm trying to give you a background to conflict management. So, your eyes act as windows into your brain. Oh, fantastic. Because if you hadn't seen that thing, that thought wouldn't have come. The problem is you saw it. And then the, thing, the thought generation process began because you saw it. Also, I like what you say. Thoughts also come from the things that you hear with your ears. Which means you listen to somebody. Then, and then lastly, well, there are many sources, but because of my time, I will just give you three. Thoughts also come from experiences and so on. But I want to, say, I want to give you another one. Thoughts come from the things that you see with your mouth. And I know maybe this sounds a bit controversial, but I, 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 I want to, 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 to bring it closer to home. Look, the words you speak, maybe you're thinking, no, 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 but I think and then speak. I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about your general way of speech, your general way of speaking. You know, sir, there is a, you have a pattern of speech that people know you like with or by. Which differs from her? Which differs from me? Which differs from her? Her. Okay, everyone is a pattern of speech. I, I, you know, in, 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 in uh, metaphysics, this is what you will learn. A human being works best in alignment. Can you say alignment? Alignment. Alignment between what? Between my words and my mind. These two things always align. They find a way to align themselves uh, uh, with each other. How? If you speak in a certain way, your mind will not have an option but to align with your Speech. It's like someone who is a, who speaks negatively all the time, or people who complain all the time. You know, it's too difficult. It's too hard. I can't. You know, people. Have you ever seen people talk like that? Mm -hmm. They're just like that. What will happen is you will begin to think like that, and then the pattern which I want to show you will continue. Which means if I want to change my mentality or my mind on something, I need to change the way I speak. If I'm always saying it's too hard, I, I can't do it. These people are so difficult to lead. This is too hard. This is too tough. You know what's going to happen? You're going to begin to think like that. That is really too hard. And then the pattern will unfold. So what is the pattern? Look, it goes like this. Your thoughts create what are called feelings. Uh -huh. Feelings. Do you know what feelings are? Uh, come on, don't pretend like you don't know what feelings are. <laughs> you know what they are. Feelings, they come from thoughts. Whatever feeling you have about anything came from the fact that you thought about that thing. And then feelings, they create what are called decisions. Because for most of us, we make decisions based on the way we feel. I, I felt like it was good for me to do it, so I did it. I mean, I decided to do it. I, I felt like it was okay, I felt like it was not okay. There was a feeling attached to it, and then there was a decision. And decisions create your actions. Because you act on a decision. I'm not talking about good or bad decisions. Whether it's a good one or a bad one, there was always a decision first before you acted. For example, you decided to come to this workshop today, and you are here. Maybe one or two people decided not to come, and they are not here. But there was a decision. All decisions create actions. 
whether it's a good action or it's a stupid action. There's always a decision. And actions that are repeated, they create what are called habits. This is how habits are formed. A habit, it started as an action. One action, which was repeated, then it became a habit. It's like smoking or drinking. It always started with one cigarette. There's no one who took four cigarettes at once and put them here. <laughs> it was one cigarette first. And I don't think there's anyone who took the first cigarette and enjoyed it. It was like, you know what, I'm going to do this again. I don't think it was like that. It was the first cigarette, which you didn't even like. You coughed so bad. <laughs> but then you took the second one, and the third one, fourth one, fifth one, until it became a, what? a habit. It was an action that created a habit. Am I speaking sense here, guys? And then habits, all together, the collection of your habits put together, they form what is called character. We all have a character here, okay? And character can also be defined as how other people know you to be like. You know, there's a saying that uh, sometimes the best person to know your character is not yourself, is the people closest to you, okay? Those that are really close. I'm sorry you hate people that go like, you know, my friend, you know me, I don't like arguing, you know, but, uh, but you know, that, that's what you do. You're like, dude, you, you argue all the time. Yeah. And we all have habits, good ones and bad ones. So we say a person is a good person if they have more good habits than bad ones, and vice versa. And then your character will create what I want to call it here, an end result. I'm trying to be very careful with this word here because some people get offended with it, but the end result. How do I change this, if you ever find yourself in, with the book? The lesson in, in this wheel of life that I drafted there was, the only way to change this is by going backwards again to the change. So you can only change the end result by changing this. This will never change unless you change that, your character. Because it's your character that led you there. Is character change possible? Is it possible to change the way you behave? Like, like possible? Yes. Yeah. But it's not, it's not easy. I think that's why they say things like think before you speak or think before you do. All right. Because that's how you uh, think before you can react to certain Okay. Thank you. But it's possible to change the way you think. Can I change my character by changing my what? My habits. Your character can never change until you change your habits. I was telling your colleagues yesterday, and I said, you know, habits, you don't change a habit by fighting it so much. You will never win that, that war if you do it like that. But that, that is a very bad way to deal with habits, bad habits. You change a habit by replacing it with another habit. It, 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 it won't know that this is true. Just as someone who tried to quit smoking, they will tell you how difficult it is. Okay, you just <laughs> all right. They st you start drinking. <laughs> they stop first day. Okay, they just woke up angry one day. You know what? I'm gonna stop. I'm gonna stop this thing. You know, this is how they do it. I'm gonna stop. And then they have a successful first day. It was you know like you know one day, man. I'm 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 out of this thing. Two days. I, on the third day, I, I you know they couldn't do it anymore. They went back again to smoke or drink or whatever habit it was. The best way to change a habit is to find another habit to replace it. Let me, let me use another example like that. You know, let's say you've got a habit of, of being late. You know people who are, who, are, who, who are always late? Like they're never early for anything. They wake up early, I mean late. They're always late for meetings. They always miss flights. You know that procrastination is a habit. A deeply ingrained pattern of behavior that somebody has. You know, you know in Africa, we have what is called African time. Have you heard of that? Yeah. <laughs> it's like there's no rush in Africa. You know, we are already behind, so there's no. <laughs> so let's say you've got a habit of being late everywhere. You are just a late person. You are never there. You know what you should do? You take up your alarm every morning, five o'clock. You know, psychologists have this 21 day rule thing. So you put up your alarm on day one. When it rings, don't put it on snooze. <laughs> Wake up. <laughs> Ah, don't switch it off. <laughs> Wake up. Day one.
day two, huh? it's a struggle, day three. You know, by the fifth day, it's very difficult now. You almost want to quit, but continue. You continue and continue. For how many days? 21 days. On the 22nd day, I personally challenge you to switch your alarm off on the 22nd day. What do you think is going to happen to you? You're most likely going to wake up at 5 o'clock. You know why? Because your body is accustomed now. You feed your child at 8 o'clock every morning. What happens if you delay by 30 minutes? You, you want to feed at half past 8. She's going to cry, isn't it? Uh huh. Why? Because she's used to the 8 o'clock. Some babies, they cry until they no longer want the food. They refuse the food altogether. But what happens if you continuously ignore the cry and just continue and continue to the half past 8 schedule? What happens to the baby? They get used to the new schedule. Now, you can't go back to the 8 o'clock. They are used now to this. Pretty much with habits. These are habits are formed and changed. All right, let's go back again. How do I change my habits? I change them by changing my actions. I cannot keep on doing the same thing and hope that the result will be different. It can never be different. The only way you change a habit is change your action. You change your action. You know, they said the classic definition of insanity is doing the same thing over and over and over and hoping that the result will be different. It will never be different. <laughs> if you do the same thing, you're going to get the same result. Mm -hmm. Okay. How do I change my action? By changing my decisions. It's the choices we make. It's the decision we are making that is making you to act like that. Now, some people always make the wrong choices. From childhood, they chose the wrong degree when they went to varsity. They chose the wrong job. They chose the wrong husband. Sorry, I mean I thank you. <laughs> no, it's not the time. <laughs> okay. How do I change my decision? By changing my feelings. Because if you keep feeling the same way, you're always going to make the same decision. It's a feeling. You know feelings can get you into trouble. Mm -hmm. You need to change the way you feel. No, but I can't help the way I feel. I just feel. I just feel. Yes. The reason why you keep feeling that way is because you have the same thoughts. The only way to change a feeling is if you change that you're thinking around that matter. Is the thinking. You keep thinking about it, you're going to feel the same way, you're going to make the same decision, and, and, and the pattern. It's like a vicious cycle. And how do I change my thinking? It means you have to change the things that we look at, those that you can help. You know, I, I, I do counseling as well. You know, do you know that there's such a thing, sorry to use this example uh, to you guys, but I for the sake of illustration, I will use it. Do you know there's such a thing, I said, taught the group yesterday as well, such a thing as sex addiction. Mm -hmm. You ever heard of it? Mm -hmm. It's there. Yeah, and you know, <laughs> in, in, in all these sessions which I have with these people, normally, what I notice is, they watch a lot of pornography. Now, check what happens. If you watch a lot of that stuff, you're going to fill your mind with the wrong thing. Can you see? Mm -hmm. And then you're going to feel what you're not supposed to feel. And then they're going to make decisions you're not supposed to make. And then they're going to act in ways that you're, suppo you're not supposed to act. Can you see? It's what, you, what the person watched. So if, if that person stops feeding their mind with the wrong stuff and they feed their mind with the right things through what they see, then the thinking can change and then the cycle can also change. How can I change my thinking? It's changing what I hear, the people that are around me, the things I listen to, and so on. And also, I need to change the way that I speak. As a person, and here I'm not trying to impress you, you know. The words that come out of your mouth. What kind of language do you have when you speak to people? <coughs> and by the way, if you're in leadership, let me just tell you a secret. If you're in leadership, and your subordinates hate you, or they don't like you, they will find a way to sabotage you. Do you know that? You want people that you lead to follow you because they want to follow you, not because they have to follow you. There are two levels of leadership. It's positional leadership and real leadership. Some people are in leadership by position. Then people follow them because they have to follow them. They don't have a choice. This is where you find people. If you ever, maybe look, just look back somewhere in your career. You probably remember that one person, that one you worked for. If he asked you to say, uh, please stay 30 minutes longer, you didn't mind to give him an extra hour, mm -hmm. just as long as you saw his, him happy. Mm -hmm. There was something about him. Mm -hmm. Isn't that so? There is a saying that people don't leave organizations, they leave bosses. You know what I'm talking about. Mm -hmm. 
Then there was that man later, that one. As soon as it was 4 o'clock, you, you, you already packed. You are out of the door. You just want to leave. <laughs> huh? Maybe 10 minutes before 4 o'clock, you are busy packing. Huh? Five minutes before four o'clock, you are going to the bathroom just to wind up. Four o'clock, you come pick your bed, you go. You don't do one minute last past four. No, nothing like that. It's leadership. And conflict is one of those opportunities you have to display your leadership qualities. And I, I'm glad I'm speaking to the right people here. So, that is how you can change what you do. Change the way you speak. Don't speak negative words for yourself. Speak positive words. Communication is at the center of it. Now, if we don't communicate well, it somewhat exacerbates conflict. Most of the conflict that we have with our peers, with our subordinates, with superiors, <coughs> or even clients, it's mainly because we are not communicating well. Because most of the time, if we are able to solve the communication aspect, you may find out that we are able to solve most of the conflict that we have. And we are all not born good communicators. We have to learn this as we grow, as we go with the journey of life. Someone who is younger still needs to learn, even if I am 40 years old, 50 years old, we, we, there's always that one thing you can always pick up and learn, you know. We have to talk about communication. Now. Guys, what do you think is communication? If someone were to, to ask you to define, what is communication? What would you say? Imagine you win an examination, someone asked you, define the term communication. What would you say? To share information. To share information. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Yes? To share information and meanings. To share information and meanings. Yeah. What do you think, sir? I haven't heard you this morning. <laughs> I think it's listening. You think it's listening? It's listening and speaking. And speaking. Okay, thank you. Yes? I think that the mode of getting your message across. The mode of getting your message across. Yes. Um, I would just say it's basically your thoughts put into words. Your thoughts put into words. Yeah. I hate somebody. Oh, yes, yes sir. Interacting. It's interacting. Interacting. Okay. So between you and other people. All right. Communication is a two-way process of transferring information from the sender to the receiver with the receiver sending feedback to the sender. Then you are communicating. If you are talking about interpersonal communication between two people, two or more people, like in this case, I am uh, the sender of the information, you are the receiver, and you are sending feedback to me, back to me. And by the way, Feedback is not necessarily response. It, it, it is just something like this. So let's say I, I say, guys, take your pens and write. I am the sender of the receiver. I've passed a message to you. You may take your pens and write. You, you may not take your pens and write. Either way, you are sending feedback to me. Now, if you don't take your pens and write, what may it mean to me? It's either. Either you're disregarding the instruction, we don't want to. Or you haven't received the message or you didn't, properly. Or you haven't received the message properly. Either way, there is feedback. And who does the encoding? The sender. And the receiver does the decoding. So what is this? You know, in communication, there's what is called a literal communication theory. Then there's what is called, no, technical communication theory and literal communication theory. Technical communication theory is almost like a, like a parable, like a little story that has a meaning, you, you know, that sort of thing, like an, an analogy. The analogy is a technical thing, then the meaning of the analogy is a literal thing. So, for example, it's like this. These two words here, code, I mean, encoding and decoding, they come from a root word called code, C-O-D-E, code, like a password. Technically speaking, just picture this. My words get out of my mouth, they get in a little box, the words, 
Then I close the box with a password or a code, like 111, I close. Then the box comes to you as the receiver. What do you have to do to the box? To decode. So the process of closing the box with a code, technically speaking, that is what is called encoding. The process of opening the box with a same code, that is what is called decoding. Now tell me, what would happen if I closed the box with a, oh sorry, I close the box with the code 111 and you try to open the box with the code 110. It won't open because the code is different. Now, literally speaking, it's like this. Encoding means to put your words in a way which is understandable by the receiver. To decode is to interpret. Like you guys, you're interpreting my words. You're interpreting what I'm saying. You're saying, what is this man saying? What is this person saying? What is he trying to say? You are decoding. To decode is to interpret. Like a decode of a TV. It gets a signal. It trans... What's the right word? It sort of takes a signal and translates the signal into a picture on the TV. That is to decode. Okay? And then you have the picture there. Now... It's like the message should be understood the way it was met. Then there's communication. One, 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 one. I remember I was training in Bloomfontein some years back and I had a group of secretaries there. So this secretary tells me that one time her boss, who happened to be also a woman, walked into the office one day holding a pack of apples. So she passes by. You know those offices where before you get to your office, you pass by your secretary's office, and then yeah. your one. I think pretty much like your office, yeah. sir. There. So he was holding a pack of apples. Then he goes like, he was. She was speaking suit, of course. She goes like, uh, ink. Ink is a suit word. What is what does ink mean? Take. It means take. That is what the boss said. On the other hand, the secretary thought the boss is saying, take the apples and eat if you like. So she took all the airports <laughs> and ate all of them. Now at 10 o'clock, the boss picks up the phone and says, hey, Margaret, can I have my airport? She's eating the last one. Can I have my airports, please? Can you see what happened here? What was the issue here? The message was not understood the way it was meant. There was miscommunication. Can you see? You can have conflict here. Some of the conflict we've had with our peers is simply because of miscommunication. Because the person who gave the message was not clear enough in making sure that we understand them. All right, the next thing here, now check. When you are communicating with somebody, this is very, very important. When you are communicating with somebody, remember communication can be verbal, can also be non-verbal. Verbal meaning spoken word. Especially when it's verbal, your message is represented by this, uh, looks like a pie, isn't it? This is your message. Like me, I'm the sender, you guys are the receiver. What I'm giving you is a message, which is represented by that part. But the message itself is made up of three things. One, in the message, there is what, everybody? Words. Words. Then there is? Voice. Voice. Then there is? Body. Body language. These three things make up the message. Is there a difference between words and voice? Yeah. What's the difference? It's how you say it. How you say it. Yeah. The sound. Yeah. I like that, yes? Yeah. I think it's the emotional part of the words. The emotional part of the words. Okay? Because you can say it smiling right. or you can say it frowning and you know, just the being how happy. you sing it, yeah. Right. So it's sure. that's your word. That's Thank you very much. So the word is what you are saying. Yeah. It's the content. Yeah? It's what you're saying. But then voice is the sound that carries those words. You know, if you, you know, you can give a different meaning to words if you use different sounds yes. and different tones. Yes. Something which was, not, which was supposed to be so easy can become complicated simply because of the voice you used. Yeah. But good communicators know it's not just the words that is important, it's also the voice and the body language. But look at this now. In your message, words, can, can, can you focus on this? In your message, words constitute only that much. 3% of your message. In other words, words don't mean much. It's not what you say that's really important. 
It's how you say what you say. It's like someone maybe your subordinate said he did something, she did something wrong, like stupid, like wrong, like they're not supposed to do this, but they did it anyway. Now she wants to apologize to you, and she's like, I saw. Her. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> do you think she's sorry if she does that? No. But can you, but she's saying sorry. So can you see words are not that important? You know, in English, words are what's called arbitrary nature. They are subject to interpretation. So it's important for you to to know it's not what you're saying, it's how you're saying. So words are almost meaningless, especially around communication. It's not what you're saying. Look at the voice. How much percentage is voice? 39. 39. You speak louder with your voice than you do with your words. And you know, this is very important. In communicating, you know, because you're going to go back to the office, you're going to communicate with colleagues, you're going to communicate with clients over the phone. Your voice matters. You can't just say, no, I apologize. What more do you want? I apologize. No. How did you apologize if you messed up? How did you say thank you? There is a way you can say thank you to somebody, which means you mean it, or which means you're just you're just being, you know, following etiquette, but not, not, you don't mean it. And look at body language. Look at that. Fifty-eight percent. This is why they say action uh, speaks louder than words. It's how you are saying what you're saying. And this is important in communication. And most of our conflict comes from this. Be simple and be clear. I don't know what has happened to our people, especially in Africa, not just in South Africa. We have this thing that if you hear someone speaking in English using big flamboyant words, we think they are smart. Have you ever come across people like that? You know, I had the opportunity to be in England for just a you know, little time. And you know when you're in England, English people, they speak English, isn't it? That's where it comes from. Mm -hmm. They are very simple when they speak. You may struggle with their accent. They've got a bit of a, an accent, especially from the north side. But their English is the simplest English you can find. Just take an African there. <laughs> yeah, okay. What's the chronology according to your chronometer? Yeah. All he wants to say is, what's the time? Seriously? Just say, what's the time? and save us the, the effort to go to a dictionary. <laughs> when you are communicating with people, some of the conflict comes from they didn't understand you because you're trying to be fancy. I don't know, I don't speak Africans well, but I don't even Africans if you have this. Do you have high Africans then? Yeah, yes. Sir. Like high words. Yeah. Don't try to impress people with your African <laughs> that is high <laughs> and your English that is high. What is the purpose of communication? It's to pass a what? A message. If the person you are giving the message doesn't understand you, then you have defeated the purpose. It's quite strange. Why we? I don't even know why we do that. You want to sound very smart. No. Be simple and clear. Read number two, everybody. You can limit your language. Uh -huh. you, can, you can limit communication, I mean, I mean conflict, by using everyday language, using familiar language. You see, at this institution, because you're an ac academic institution, there's a language you use here, which is different from the language used in Standard Bank. You must use words that people are familiar with. Here, yeah, I'm not talking about simple words, I'm talking about UJ language, yeah. a university language, which is different from a bank language. Familiar words when you communicate with people. You remind me one time, <laughs> a man, he was drowning in a pool of water. He was drowning this guy. And he was screaming, Assistant! <laughs> people were just passing by. Assistant! <laughs> Assistant! And people were just going. When the water was almost here, he began to say, Help! Then people began to help him. Do you say assistance when you need help? <laughs> Besides, in Africa, we have people that are called assistants. So we don't know whether they're calling a person. <laughs> Or you really want help. <laughs> Use words which are familiar. Do you know even in this room, if someone screams assistance somewhere in the corridor, we will remain sitting down. Yeah. But if there's a, someone says help, we will all run out to help that person. Because we associate that word with something. So use everyday language. <coughs> Be concrete. 
Be specific as well when you communicate with people. Don't give instructions that are half bad or a message that is half bad, which is not uh, uh, concrete enough. Specific. What is it that you need? Then you can uh, you can limit some of the conflicts that we have in the world. Another very important skill in communication is this. Everybody is for me? Active I can't hear you. Active, Active listening. listening. Uh huh. Listening is very important in communication. Some of the conflict we have with other people is because we just don't listen. If we just look at some of the conflict you have had over the last few weeks with other people, the problem might just be no one between the two of you is listening. <laughs> Most of those things could have been solved if you just kept quiet. You listen. You know what, what happens when you listen? When you listen, you empower yourself to respond accurately. If you, if you don't have time to listen to that person, be assertive enough to tell them at that time that, look, I can't talk to you right now. I'm so busy with this. Can you talk about this at 10 o'clock? You are being assertive, isn't it? Don't pretend like you are listening and then you are not. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, you seem like you understood what the instruction was, but then you didn't. So what I'm saying is, listening is very important. Be a good listener. And listening is a skill. It's a skill which we are... We are not born good listeners as such. We have to learn it, how to listen. Because human beings, we are generally a bit selfish. We want to be the ones to be listened to than the ones to listen. So smart people don't talk much. Smart people listen much than they talk. Sometimes people are bad listeners because they jump to conclusion. I know what you want to say. Hey. Maybe there's that particular student, that particular one. Who comes to you? It's like you already know what they want. You've dealt with them last week. Yeah? You think you know. You don't yeah. Think you, are jump, yeah. you think you know. You are jumping to conclusions. Then you become a bad listener. Or having a closed mind around a particular person or a particular issue to say there is a particular person you just don't want to listen to. Or a particular subject you don't want to, to, to talk about. Or thinking that everybody thinks as you do. Or excessive talking. Some people are bad listeners because they just talk too much. Okay? Or arrogance. What can you tell me? You are just a dime. You know? If it's like that. You are just a student. Or you are just an administrator. Or you are just a woman. Or you know people who do that. Yeah. Wishful hearing. Hearing only the things you want to hear. Yeah. <laughs> or prejudice and fear and other reasons. This is, these are some of the stumbling blocks to listen. So you must avoid all this. Never jump to conclusions. Don't talk too much. Don't be arrogant. Don't have a wandering mind and so on and so on. Okay, good. The other thing I want to show you, just before we start talking about conflict in its uh, isolation, there is something which is called the social mirror. Can you say social mirror? Social mirror. Now, what is a mirror? A mirror is a reflecting device. You look at it, then you can see yourself. So this is the social mirror, divided into two parts. It's yourself, Versus others. Conflict is always like this. It's you and other people. You and the other person. You and your superior. You and your subordinate and your colleague or whatever. So this part is myself. This part is the other person. What is my role? What role have I played? Then you can take corrective measures if you can see your role that you have played. And I told you also that sometimes if you take a good look at whatever is happening around conflict between you and the other person, you may actually say that it's you who is the problem than the other way around. Then that's what you are mature. Now, everything starts here. Can you read this for me, everybody? One, two, go. Image of myself. Image of myself. This means, what kind of an image do you have about yourself? When you look at yourself, what kind of a person do you think you are? How do you see yourself? Alone, how do you see yourself? Because the way you see yourself creates what? Your attitude. All your attitudes, they come from the way you see yourself. Now, what is attitude? Attitude is a, is a way of doing something, you know? There's a way you greet people. There's a way you talk to people. There's a way. That's called an attitude. Uh-huh. It comes from your attitude. Now, these actions that you do towards other people, 
create the other people's expectations of you. The way you behave towards your subordinate, it creates an expectation now on that subordinate. Uh, how do I put it? Let's, let's use this example. Let's say on Monday, you've got a daughter, let's say, but on Monday, you just decided, you know what, I'm going to buy my daughter chocolate. You, you buy a bar of chocolate. <coughs> she never asked for the chocolate. It's you who decided to buy, to buy the chocolate. You go, you give it on Monday. It's a kid. She will be happy. On Tuesday, you bought it again. It's a kid. She will be happy. On Wednesday, you bought it again. It's a kid. She will be happy. What happened on this? Can you see that your action created a what? An expectation. She didn't ask for the chocolate. You bought the chocolate. Now she expects the chocolate. Now, because she expects the chocolate, let's say on Thursday, she doesn't buy the chocolate. What happens? She begins to evaluate what? Your action. To evaluate means to say, why didn't mommy or daddy buy me chocolate today? What's up with him? Or what's up with her? <laughs> Come on, you know what I'm talking about. She's, she's evaluating you now. And the attitude will create a, what? a reaction. This is when you send, maybe you ask your daughter and say, uh, whatever your name is, please go get me a glass of water. You know, so she gets the glass of water, but then when she comes, you know, she's sulking. <laughs> then you look at her. What's happening? You are evaluating now that reaction. This is you now. To evaluate, you are, you are looking at the child and you're like, why are you walking like that? Why are you behaving like that? Now you think the child is a problem, but you created it. Can you see your, 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 your issue here? You created an expectation which you can maintain. Now, you think the other person has a problem. But the source of this problem was actually you. This is why you must never over-promise. But you can't deliver. And then you can't deliver. Mm -hmm. It's always better to under-promise <laughs> and over-deliver. Because the expectations are not as high, unlike if it's the other way. When you don't see things the same way as the other person. It can lead to conflict. So which one is the conflict? Is it, is it the not seeing? The misunderstanding. The misunderstanding. Yeah. Okay. So conflict is generally disagreements that happen between two or more people. Okay. When you have different in opinion, when you have personality clashes, when you don't see things the same way. I want you to tell me whether this is true or it's false. I will read the first one for you. Number one, conflict destroys relationships. It's safer and smarter to ignore conflict. True or false? False. false. Number two, it's usually impossible to resolve conflict. False. True or false? Number four or three, if I have conflicts with others, I'm not a good person. False. Someone always gets hurt in a conflict. If I give in, I will look weak and vulnerable. False. <laughs> Four, it's wrong to disagree with those in authority. False. Can you really disagree? Yes. With those in authority? Yes. And it's okay? Yeah. All right, good. I want to give you a scenario. I want to give you a scenario here. All right. Uh, hey, this is the part I, I, it's a bit difficult to do, but, but I will just do it anyway. <laughs> Alright, how, how do I phrase this? Uh, let's say you're, you're superior. We all have superiors. There's always someone above us, all of us. Okay. Let us say for some reason, he, starts, he or she starts shouting at you in front of other people. Your superiors. So screaming at you, 
shouting at you because you did something wrong. He's angry. Or oh, he's angry. Huh? What would you do if it was you? Don't tell me what would be nice to do. I want to know what you would have done. Or what you would do. You, 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 the way you know yourself. What would you really do? Forget his ear, forget his ear, forget your executive. He also has executives, he also has a superior above him. But what would you do? Your, your, your supervisor? Our time to get lost. He shall get lost with you. You would tell him to get lost. Yeah. <laughs> this is you. Talk, you don't talk to me like this. You don't so talk to me like that. Then you react in that moment. So but, in, in the moment, in the heat of the moment, you don't. But um, I will react on on the problem. I okay. won't um, target the person. Okay. Personal. But I don't want to personal. I'll target the problem. All right. What would you do? Yes. I'll probably walk away and not cry in the joint. Okay, this is you. I have to talk to. What about you? Thank you very much. For me, it depends. Sometimes I'll walk away. <laughs> but sometimes I will have to deal with it there and there. And what do you mean deal with it there and there? Sorry. Not shout back, but tell someone that it's not acceptable the way how they are dealing with that matter. So can you see we all react differently? Mm -hmm. All right. You know, in psychology, you learn human behavior. Human behavior, okay, is categorized into three types. This will help you to deal with conflict. So I'll just say here, types of human behavior. There are three of them. Okay, one, there is what is called aggressive behavior. Say aggressive behavior. Aggressive behavior. You see, there are people who, by default, huh, they are aggressive. Even in this situation, when this person is shouting and shouting and shouting, they react aggressively. Is a type A, yeah. then there's a type B. Type A is the type that reacts immediately right there. You know, like you too, yeah. your mother too. You know, yeah. goes on. <laughs> and all your ancestors and yeah, you know, they are like that. <laughs> Come on, you have seen them. I once trained a PA who is like this. You know, one time who shouted back at the minister. <laughs> I won't tell you which minister. Minister was standing there. She was like, you too! I don't care! You know, pointing at him, you know? And don't think she will continue tomorrow. Tomorrow she will be like, come on, say. Like, let it happen. That's aggressiveness. Okay, but that is type A. Type B, type B is the type that is aggressive, but they don't react like that immediately. So the boss will shout and shout and shout, they will wait for you to finish. <laughs> when, you, when the boss is done and is going to his office, these ones will fall into his office. Yeah. <laughs> and, and close the door behind you. <laughs> what was that all about? I want you to tell me what. <laughs> <laughs> that is type what? B. Type B. But the key thing here is there is something that is called, there is no respect here. That is the key word. These are people who speak their mind without any respect. They are not the respecters of offices or whatever. This one can say that to anyone, even if it's the VC standing here, they can say that. They are by default like that. Yes. But then the boss who is shouting at you doesn't respect you. Yeah, of course. I'm just showing you the character. He he's, he's, he didn't do right. The second type of behavior that is there is called passive behavior. Everybody say passive behavior. Passive behavior. Now, passive people are the exact opposite of aggressive behavior. These are people who can do all this. Okay? These ones, when they shout and shout and shout, the passive person will just keep quiet. When it's done, they go to the bathroom and cry. <laughs> they cry. When they are done, they come to the office. They continue like everything is normal. Yeah, yeah. Another person shouts at them again. They just go again and they cry. 
they are like that. These people, they are normally very nice people, very sweet people. They find it difficult to say no to anything, to most things. Yeah. If they are giving extra work, they just say, okay. Mm. Yeah. More work, okay. Okay. Let's go to Cape Town. Okay. <laughs> I want to marry you now. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> they are what? Passive. By default. They are like this all the time. Then there's a third type of behavior, which is called assertive behavior. Say assertive behavior. Assertive. And there's a, there's a sort of a uh, misunderstanding between these two, aggressiveness and assertiveness. People normally don't understand the difference. But, Assertive people now, I have got 40 men. I'll be done now. Assertive people now, what they do, these are people who speak their mind, but this time with what? With respect. With respect. That's the key word there. They have what is called emotional intelligence. You know, there's IQ, then there's EQ. You know the difference? Yeah. IQ, what is IQ? Okay. Cognitive intelligence, cognitive abilities. There are people who are naturally smart people to solve problems and find solutions for issues and stuff like that. They are, they are smart, they are intelligent. But I told you at the beginning, because of standardization, that is not as important now. Of course, because if you're an accountant, you're an accountant. You do the balance sheet the same way. <laughs> it doesn't necessarily need you to be very smart. You just do the balance sheet. But there is what is called EQ. EQ talks about emotional intelligence. It is five things, okay? Self-awareness and quite a few others. I don't have time now to delve much into it, but I will explain to you what, what emotional intelligence is all about. But assertive people, they speak their mind with respect. So in the same situation, like this one, where somebody shouts at you in public, an assertive person will not shout back, will not go to the bathroom and cry, they will wait. For you to finish. When he's done, they will go back to their workstation, continue working, and wait for the right time. The right time can be the end of that day, it can be tomorrow morning, or next week Monday, but there's always the right time. This person is emo enough emotional intelligence to wait and to manage their emotion in such a way that they always look for the right time to have this conversation. They never let it go. It always has to happen. What happened? It always has to be spoken about. They also use what is called the eye technique. The eye technique, I feel. they always talk about I feel, I think. Remember, there is something like this. I want to show you here. You must know, ladies and gentlemen, that there is no one in this world who can upset you. There is no one. It's what they do or what they say that makes you upset. So address the action, not the person. Now, before I get this, let's just talk about the, the, the action, I mean the eye technique. Aggressive people always use the word you. Like if an aggressive person in a meeting, if they disagree with you, they will say, you are wrong. You are wrong. That's an aggressive person. An assertive person will say, um, I, I beg to differ. Or I have a different opinion. This is, this is respectful. I, I say it differently. An assertive person will say, I don't like the way you look at me. An aggressive person will say, why are you looking at me like that? Yeah. <laughs> it's in the choice of words. Yeah. There's also something called passive aggressiveness. It's, it's such a thing. Passive aggressiveness is like when you are mad at someone. Yeah. <laughs> you are mad at him. And then he comes and say, ah, good morning. You just, you just look at him like, <laughs> so you can't hear, see anything. That is passive aggressive. There is such a thing. Alright, so uh, you always use the word I. So in this case, if you want to be assertive, let's say he shouted you in public, what you do now is wait for the right time, which will be the end of that day, or tomorrow morning. Then you go into his office. Yeah, please come in. Can I help you? Yeah, say, can we just talk a little bit? Yeah, sure. Uh, it's about what happened you know, two days ago. Uh, oh, yeah, 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 let's talk about it. You know, say, when you shout at me in public, what are you addressing? It makes me feel embarrassed. Mm -hmm. yeah. And it is a negative effect on my confidence levels and performance. Mm -hmm. 
That's if I remedy. I would prefer that if next time I do something wrong, you speak to me in. That is a setting. And respectful. I always say 80% of the time it's going to work. But of course, you always get 20% bosses from hell. You know those ones? Yeah. Who will not like it? This yeah, is yeah. like, all right? Then it becomes another mind. issue which can be spoken, which, which we're not talking about here. It becomes, of which you can lay agreements or whatever. But in this case, this is how you become assertive. So we all need each other here. We are, if we did our performance management system well, if it's a proper system, it should be that if you mess up, the next person will mess up. This is this how the system should work. It's a system. Okay? So we need each other. We can't work in silos where you do your own thing. You don't care how it will affect the next person. So we need to keep this good relationship. Because if we are working well together, there is this open communication where we are communicating with each other well. We understand that my work impacts on the next person and the next person and the next person. Then I know I have to talk to everybody. I have to be to have good relationships with everybody. Because my work is if to the next person, and the next person, the next person, and the next person. Up until you get to our vision and our mission. So that is aggressiveness. It's not good. It destroys relationships. And ultimately, you will not meet your targets. And then next, passiveness is not good because it destroys you, yeah. the person. You keep keeping this stuff that this person is doing to you, then this thing is going to grow and grow and grow, one day you are going to snap and they will wonder, is it Pindi who did that? Or is it so and so who did that? And it will be good. You know, there are very nice people in prison who are not supposed to be in prison. But because they kept stuff inside, they ended up killing somebody. If you go to prison, you won't find, it's not all criminals with scars. You find some people that you wonder, why, what are you doing here? You can tell this person doesn't belong here. But she kept this thing growing and growing and growing and growing and growing until one day she couldn't get it anymore. She took a gun, she shot somebody dead because of passiveness. But yes to assertive behavior. This one is good. It builds relationships. Always talk to each other. If somebody upsets you, tell them. This is what you will learn. A human being, you and I and everybody else, we are made up of three things. You have a physical body. I don't want to talk about things you won't understand here. You have a body, this body, this one, the one you have. Okay? This body is so that you can be able to relate with physical things. So you can put on nice clothes, you can put on your watch, you can sit here. So you can live in this physical world. This is the physical world where we can see things. You need this body. It's like your body is like your house which you live. Yeah. It's not the real you. You would be mistaken somewhere to think this is me, but this is your house in which you live. And the house, it gets older. Huh? Some have pretty houses, <laughs> some not so pretty houses. <laughs> but you get what I'm saying. But it's your house. Hello? <laughs> you live in that house. So this is not the real you. The real you is where? Inside the house. Now, that's your body. But inside your body, you have a mind. Can you say mind? Mind. Your mind is in your body. It's not your body. It's in your body. What is your mind for? I said your body to relate with physical things. Mind to relate with intellectual things. For you to be able to reason and to think, you need your brain. Your body can't think, but your brain can think. Your mind can think. So I've given you two things now. Then there's this third person, which houses your emotions. All your emotions, good and bad, they are housed by this third person. I'll just, I'll just call it emotions. Your mind is not emotional. Your mind is purely for reasoning. Your body, purely for relating with physical things and to house you. Then this emotional person to house your emotions, all the emotions you feel. Emotions are like feelings of anxiety, worry, happiness, all these ones, huh? caring for people, all this, anger, all those are emotions. They are housed in your emotional person. So I gave you three things, your body, your mind, and your emotions. Now, psychologists have somewhat discovered 
a very interesting trend between reason and emotion. You know what is the trend? They always seem to pull apart each other. They seem to fight. They seem to be this war between reason and emotion. In what sense? When reason pulls this way, emotion always wants to pull that way. Maybe let me give you a practical example. Like, you remember the example I gave you? When your superior is shouting at you in front of other people, do you know what's happening inside you really? What will be happening there is your mind will say to you, hey, don't shout back. If you shout back, you may lose your job. If you lose your job, what's going to happen to your kids? And, and can, this is this how the mind works. It's the reasons like that. You know your mind can tell you five years from now, it can tell you the reaction. Even before those people who are in prison now for murder, their mind told them, don't take that gun and shoot. If you take that gun and shoot, chances are you're going to get arrested. Then you're going to go to prison. And my friend, you don't want to be in prison. That's how the mind works. But this guy doesn't think like that. Emotions begin to boil. When if he continues shouting, emotions begin to say, I shall pay man. How do you <laughs> and he just continues to talk to you like this. <laughs> if he continues, you feel yourself boiling. I want to talk about it, just this little illustration. Just bring it here. Do this with your hands, everybody. Do this with your hands. Alright. <coughs> this is reason. Say reason. 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 Emotion. emotion. Okay, let's put it down. You will do it maybe two or three more times. But look, reason, emotion. Now, what is outside? Outside is the body. You have the body outside. If it's like this, reason is still above emotion. And why do these two things fight? They fight because they want to get control of the body. Whoever wins the war is complete control of the body. And the body is a very obedient thing. It can do anything. I told that group the other time to say, you know, all people, including you guys, and me, and everybody else, we are all capable of even murder. You just need the right reason the right environment, the right weapon, the right person. Come on. <laughs> you know what I'm talking about. You will commit murder. Right. So if it's like this, reason is saying, don't shout back. But this guy, if he continues shouting, look, if it's like this, reason then gives an instruction to the body to say what? Stay cool. Because he's the one in charge now. Then the body remains cool like that. Just before you ask, do this again one more time. One more time. So outside is the body. These things are inside. Mm -hmm. So he continues shouting. <coughs> this one is saying, don't shout back. But this one begins to boil. If he continues, it begins to boil now. Mm -hmm. Come on, let's rise together. Right. He is rising. Yeah. You know, you can feel it inside you. Yeah. It's coming like, hey, man, hey, man. <laughs> it's coming, you know. Let's go together. Let's go. It's coming. What it wants to do is overtake this guy mm -hmm. and get control of the body. Mm -hmm. But if it continues and continues, let's continue, let's continue, let's continue, let's continue. If it gets here, this is called a point of equilibrium. Say equilibrium. Equilibrium. This is where you find yourself shaking. You ever find yourself shaking? <laughs> you start feeling each man. Do you know what's happening to you? If what's happening is your body is saying to you, guys, tell me what to do. I don't know what to do now. You are confusing me. You start feeling itchy everywhere. You start walking around, you're like, yeah, 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 yeah. You know what's happening there? That's what your body is doing. And then if you let this happen, who is in control now? And he has control of who? The body. That's when you start saying to, to the supervisor, you too, your mother too, and all your ancestors and your what, what, you know? You are angry now. Or maybe punching, or whatever, or you shout back. Because your emotions are controlling. Here's the lesson in this. I want you to do this one more time. One last time. The lesson in this is this. Uh, when your emotions rise, always raise your reason. If emotions rise again, raise your reason. Why did they rise again? And again, and again, and again, and again. That way, you are always in charge of your emotions. Are you following? I'm not saying that when your boss shouts at you tomorrow or another day, you stand in front of him and go like... Not like that. <laughs> this happens inside you, okay? You should control it. Just in there, you know, you're like... Don't go like... 
<laughs> so that is how you become emotionally intelligent. The weakest person on earth is one who cannot control his emotions. How are you? Good itself. Good, good. How did the workshop go? I think it went well. Um, we got what we expected out of this. Mm -hmm. A lot of the staff members came in reluctantly, not knowing what to expect from this. Yeah. But I think it was good that we keep it short and sweet to the point. Um, everybody's under pressure and uh, a lot of deadlines. So we uh, we got what we expected. Uh, we um, touched some nerves, which yes. was good. Yes. Because we always want to take people just the bond beyond that line mm -hmm. to take them a bit further and to understand yes. a different perspective to do to, to, uh, conflict management and resolution. Mm -hmm. What was nice is also that you, uh, you brought them from the ground level up, so you started slowly taking them from communication skills, mm -hmm. how to listen carefully, yeah. um, how to address and compose yourself in conflict situations, and then end it off with what can I use tools uh, to resolve issues. Yeah, not definitely. Mm -hmm. Would you think that this is um, uh, something which should be universal, maybe across across board in companies, generally speaking. Yeah, I, th I think it's a good uh, refresher training as well. If you could have a um, just the groundwork done yes. for conflict resolution and management that, that touches a lot of the different components of that um, and use that across the, the company, it's, it's very, very good. I think everybody then would understand how to address somebody else in that conflict situation. Uh, what nice is is also that. Um, you have everybody working together, so it's a sort of a team building session. You can laugh together and joke about people, mm -hmm. and you directly see people in the different roles mm -hmm. as you work through the training. So you can see that the person is is overly aggressive a lot of the mm -hmm. time. So they personally need to work on that, and then you need to approach them in a different way. So don't take it personally, things like that. But it, it'll be good if we can do that a lot more regularly because you need to, to be refreshed on this every now and again. Fantastic. Thank you. Thank you very much.